I'm not gonna uh, share the whole story. I'm just gonna share the core of it because it is a pretty long short story. It's um, a good amount, but it's like written really small letters and um, this is a book. I got this off uh, the streets literally. I like the way it's written. I like this author, I think in general. Basically what this story is, I think, is turning Orientalism on its head. How people view the other on its head. Let's get to it. At this point I only read like half the story, um, so I'm excited to finish the full one, but I'm gonna start over. Part 1. The caravan clowns came to town about four times a year. They came now to the town, the oldest in the world, out of service and with no clear purpose. They were strictly on a bold, bashful skylark. There were a few less than a hundred of them. They were slight, smiling, shy, desert Arabs. The guards of the city, though they usually treated the clowns with a lowering sort of theatrical harshness, really liked them, but especially they liked to devil them. This was in the month of March of the year of Restored Salvation 635. So several of the tall town guards demanded and they clapped the slight desert youths roughly on the shoulders, calling them names, asking them, what do you want in our town? In a deviling manner, I guess. Bread. We want bread, one of the Arabs, less bashful than the others, announced. The desert Arabs did not have bread of their own. They ate camel cheese and small animals that they killed in the sand and rocks. They ate wild figs or cultivated apricots and pomegranates and almonds when they could steal them. Several of the kind, though thunderously threatening guards, brought hot bread from a bread booth and gave it to the Arabs. I will not eat your bread, said Khalid ibn al Walid. It isn't right that I should eat your bread and then come back and cut the throats of all of you who will not kneel and beg for mercy. With the little sword you will cut our throats, the guard asked. Let me see that wonderful little throat cutter you have there. Khalid handed his sword up to the high hand of the tall guard. The guard snapped it in two in his fingers and gave the pieces back to the slight Arab. Khalid's face broke and he began to cry. The other Arabs ate the wonderful bread that was given to them. They ate apricots and roasted meat. They talked with the town people and the town guards. The Arabs were called the Desert Scrolls. They drank the bright wine that the people gave them. All the Arabs did these things except Khalid, who refused to eat or drink though he had always loved the wine of this place. Several of the guards held quiet conference. Then, one of the guards, the one who had broken the sword in his fingers, brought back a real Damascus sword out of his generosity. For this was Damascus, the oldest town in the world. Then all the Arabs went out by the east gate. New paragraph. That cannot really be Khalid ibn al-Walid the Great, was the unbelieving protest of John Dragon was Dean of Soft Sciences at Southwestern Polytech. It just isn't possible. It does strain credulity, Joseph Waterwich told him. But that's the way it comes through and that's the way it's projected. I must suppose it's all valid. It couldn't be otherwise. John Dragon, Joseph Waterwich, Chris Benedetti, and Abel Langood were on expedition to observe certain events here by para-archaeological probe. Hitti, who is never wrong, has written that the Arabs carried long straight swords and scabbards flung over the right shoulder, and Bello, who is also never wrong, has written that they had carried short curved scimitars on their thighs. This is why I think it's so connected to Orientalism. This was written in 1974, and Edward Said wrote Orientalism in 1978, and so I'm not really sure about the history because in his book, he, where I am at right now, he really shows and emphasizes how the very concept of Orientalism is very much founded on the scholarly writings, um, but also storytellers or who are telling Oriental stories through their eyes, in effect, to understand this other more than the other themselves, the Orientals, 
this case and understand themselves. So that's why it's interesting that this author shows something that is quite scholarly, which is the swords, because that's pretty scholarly, like an object that can be studied, it's factual, you can learn more about it, you know, it's an anthropology, right? And so this moment in time is important enough for a bunch of people to use technology to study it. And it seems like it's for the first time that you're looking at this. It's like, you know, you have evidence in front of you and you make certain guesses as to what those people would have been like. If you have technology that will literally allow you to look at the past like it's a movie, you would want to check whether the scholars were right. It's, it's important to note always who is writing the story because the perspective matters. Giving people the autonomy to tell their own stories and not really doing it for them. Subjectivity is true, but I think when it's a group of people together, it makes it more objective in general. Uh, when I read more of what's gonna happen it was a little shocking and jarring. Until I read even more and gave it a chance and I realized what this author was doing, I thought it was pretty cool. So it seems like it's supposed to have been a six month siege according to the records, but it doesn't seem like it was that way according to the events that they're looking at through the pro. They say, I do not know why history, feeling guilty perhaps, is sometimes impelled to supply false reasons. Better no reasons than false. And there are no reasons for the results from the masses. Those of the expedition were able to see what was going on at the evening session in the council room. And what was going on was the developing workers. So there were seven great men sitting in the high seats in the council room. Again, same like the guards, pompous men, somewhat amused now and a little bit fearful. Basically, it seems like the person who showed up as Khalid is jumping around the rafters on, on, of the ceiling. And then the guards are trying to catch him, but they're not able to because he's really quick and witty and he seems to be saying things continuously in a genie-like manner. And they were disturbed by his enthusiasm and his assuredness for someone who doesn't seem like he can do what he's saying he's going to do, which is to command, to rule, and to slaughter. Your eyes are put in your heads wrong, and they look out wrong, Colin taunted. Your eyes look for me where I am no longer to be found. You doubled your defenses to keep me out, with you city fathers, but I am not out. I am the mind worm working inside, and I beseech you from inside. I came in under the walls and under your minds by the other river, the one that is not to be found in your country or in the maps of it. You great men cannot understand this. Circumstances sometimes put forward to explain these happenings are in fact later circumstances created by these same happenings. Right? <laughs> the clear truth is that, that the desert Arabs were inferior to all their neighbors in all these ways and even warfare. But yeah, I'm not gonna talk about the religion part. I'm just not I'm just gonna see about that. So yeah, they keep saying how throughout history people have been trying to understand it. Like suddenly the Islamic expansion, the conquest was everywhere and people were suddenly under their rule. This brings into question the whole subject of reality. Reality has been an assumption, a postulate, an evidence basis and beginning. It now seems to have been a false assumption. Reality has disappeared on us when we had the temerity to examine it too closely. What we now need to find and to use is a workable alternate to reality. This is where they talk about the rivers of Damascus. The rivers of Damascus, as mentioned in scripture, are two. The Abana River and the Farfar River. But where are they now? So the Abana River is now named the Barada. This is the only river of Damascus to be found in the physical world. There is no other river in that part of the country. There is no dry bed where any other river could have run in some other age, anywhere on earth. Well then, have you looked under the earth? Have you looked inside the earth? Have you looked inside the creatures of the earth? When a river is lost, we must leave no land or mind unturned until we have found it. 
for a lost river may be anywhere. I believe that the Parfer River has always been of the internal sort. It is a secret river that not only greens the soul, but also runs under walls and gains entrance to all fortified and walled places of the world and of the mind. Regard your own estate and case. Is your own town not built on two rivers which are separated by firmament in between? One of them is the impossible river by which all things may enter anywhere. We'd be robbed of our celestial birth. Thank you so much for watching part one of reading Rivers of Damascus and the connections to the prevailing concept of Orientalism so far in the story. In part two, we will hear more about how science gatekeeps people and other fields through the eyes of R.A. E. Lafferty.